Welcome to our case study uh, on Eastern Standard. Um, we are not uh, going to go into a lot of technical um, aspects of the case study during the deck present presentation, but we're certainly willing to entertain any and all questions afterwards, and we're going to go uh, relatively quickly uh, through it. This is a, a nice project that came together uh, well, and so we're uh, interested in, uh, in in using it as an example of, of just how good uh, Drupal still is and is be becoming even more so um, at being the glue that holds a lot of things together for organizations. Uh, that glue uh, ha wasn't doing such a great job of holding things together for Eastern Standard um, previously. They had a lot of different uh, micro sites and projects going on uh, and it made their workflow very difficult. They had some significant in in integrations, uh, perhaps a little bit more than most financial institutions that uh, you might be used to did their uh, mutual bank. They're actually the oldest mutual bank in the, in the country, uh, 200 odd years old. I don't think they've been on the web that quite that long. Uh, but they had a significant footprint uh, and uh, a, lo a lot of uh, different moving parts that were very cumbersome uh, for them. Um, they're uh, also um, uh, a community-minded organization. Uh, I forgot to tell you about FFW. Uh, I'll do that really quickly, okay? So um, our thing is we like to make um, experiences on both sides of the screen. Um, uh, as great as they can be, and what that basically means is we care about what we deliver for our clients and their visitors, but we also care about what we put our clients through, uh, and we want them to uh, enjoy their experience working with our teams and our developers, so we put a lot of emphasis into process and making sure that um, uh, it, it's good while it's happening, not just good while it's uh, delivered and over. Uh, and we've managed to still do this even though we've become quite distributed. Uh, we've been in New Jersey since day one. Uh, um, we recently actually moved from Princeton to Homedale, uh, but we also teamed up with a few other organizations and formed a global organization really to follow um, many of our clients who uh, well, have global footprints. Uh, right now our client profile is uh, ranges from startup to really big, um, but um, we have an awful lot of folks right in that middle segment uh, as well now. So um, uh, lots of different, lot of different logos. We're really proud and, and privileged uh, uh, of, but also particularly proud and privileged of our ability to still sponsor activities in the in the community. And we're a founding uh, sponsor of Drupal Camp in New Jersey, and. Um, uh, Today uh, is actually uh, my 13th uh, anniversary in the Drupal uh, community, and I always enjoy spending it uh, here at Drupal Camp, New Jersey. My particular thing is uh, I head up the uh, Learning Services Unit uh, at FFW, and so we do free training starting this month. There is a free training every week on Drupal uh, and on solutions-oriented topics like accessibility, and uh, user experience and the like, so visit our website, and hopefully we have something that's of, of value or that you can pass along to other folks. Yeah, see, proof, 13 hours, but I'll be spending uh, the, the, the th 13 years and one day here in this session. And my colleague, David, um, who has also been involved in the Drupal community for a long time, is our manager of uh, learning and uh, contributions, so uh, a great resource uh, for I you don't to talk know to. My hours are down to you. Yeah, <laughs> um, eleven years. Eleven, right? Um, so yeah, so so the challenge was is, was to take this footprint from uh, for Eastern Bank and really make sense of it. Right? Um, they uh, did not have a large team of folks that uh, knew. Um, the correct uh, path or how to implement it. They're a very relatively small financial order organization. Uh, okay, uh, what's happening? Oh, 
Okay. Uh, I wish we had a picture of the old uh, uh, site, but Eastern Bank prides themselves really on being a very uh, progressive institution, has a long history of supporting um, a broad uh, group of constituencies. And they really wanted their new site, their branding, uh, and their functionality to reflect that, right? From the look and feel of it right on through to accessibility uh, at all aspects. Uh, of the site for all folks. So uh, they celebrated their 200th anniversary, and it was kind of a big deal for them, this, this lift. Uh, uh, and they also had a very active, ongoing, uh, charitable uh, arm and wing. And they didn't want to marry these two things together, but they wanted to be able to uh, do the entire refresh at the same time. Uh, and they wanted to uh, limit uh, complexity uh, because there are completely different uh, staffs and people that work on them. They also wanted to uh, limit their risk, of which they had a little bit more exposure uh, than most organizations, not just because they were a financial institution, but because some of their entry points to their private banking uh, portals resided on the main uh, corporate site, um, which is not necessarily the, the case. Yeah, so I think I just covered all this. Yeah, I think building out the campaigns and marketing initiatives is, is kind of a big deal. That's what a lot of these organizations need now, but they don't have that flexibility. Um, I think it's kind of frustrating when we build a lot of projects where, especially when we've taken over like reclamation projects, some of you probably experienced that where the code base is not exactly very agile, right? But marketing people need to be able to adjust very quickly in order to do something, put up a campaign, whether that's a landing page, maybe it's just making modifications, maybe it's A-B testing on the site, things like that. Like marketing often needs to move fast in this world, but a lot of sites that are built by people can't move fast. So some of the things we're able to implement is basically geared around being designing a system and an infrastructure that can be modified quickly, uh, which really helps them um, be as nimble as they need to on the marketing end. Because at the end of the day, that's what these sites need to do. They actually have to have a purpose and fulfill that need. Yeah, and this was an inter interesting in that this project was really driven by the marketing folks at, at Eastern and supported, of course, by the technical and the IT folks. Um, but the marketing folks were putting, putting forward some very um, technical um, uh, needs. And uh, one of the things that they could not do is, is innovate quickly with their old you know, patchwork of, of, of sites. And what they really asked us to, to do was build them something that they could extend and grow with and expand on. And of course, Drupal was perfect for that. Um, and so uh, the architecture uh, really had quite a few things um, that it had to ac accommodate, not just at launch, but uh, six, 12, 18 months, and <coughs> three years uh, down the line. Uh, and so that was an important cons consideration. Right. Uh, and think about things like, from the marketing perspective, if you have disparate sites, like a WordPress site and a Drupal site, and maybe some other site, and you need to build a new component that might be, a, you as a marketing person see it as a design component that fulfills a certain need, because it has some purpose, like maybe it's displaying some particular membership information and it's designed a certain way. And you need that thing to go to all the sites because it's used in all those places. Um, how do you do that when you have a Drupal site and a WordPress site and something else and a bunch of other sites? Well, you end up coding it separately for all of them and going to each site and redoing all that work over and over again. You don't really want to do that. So that's why it's important to build some sort of infrastructure where you can use like agnostic components that you can then push to all these different sites and they know how to actually use them. Or shared content that goes to all these different sites. That's the API driven part of it. Like, Can I make a news article as a marketing person in the Drupal site and have that news article also get pushed to the WordPress site so that I don't have to do it twice? Right? Are you able to do those kinds of things? And Drupal is able to provide us a lot of the functionality to do that kind of stuff. And so um, as an extra 
uh, layer, part of the patchwork of their, their digital presence included uh, a technology that was sunsetting for them. Uh, subscriptions and support contracts uh, that were expiring. So not only did they have to maintain uh, several different types of stacks, um, but they were losing their support for, for those stacks. And if anybody's ever worked with a SharePoint uh, a stack, that's kind of scary. So um, I think the turnaround time, we had done quite a bit of work with Eastern Bank but the turnaround time for this particular project was about three months, which is relatively quick for this type of complex project. So and they really wanted this to come out. You know, we do good things to help people prosper. Uh, and so uh, as, as part of this, we were approached to actually uh, manage their rebranding and a big part of this project within the three months was not just the technical um, uh, architecture and development and implementation and launch uh, of their project but was actually starting from scratch and designing so we did that as well as all the information architecture uh, for it And then finally, um, they were really committed to the idea of accessibility. So um, we work with a lot of uh, organizations that say, oh yeah, we just did a, a, a build and we forgot to make it accessible. Or we forgot that once uh, it launched, we still have to keep it accessible. Um, Eastern Bank really um, was one of the first clients that we started working with that understood that um, it was really all about digital inclusion and that accessibility is kind of the minimum standard. Uh, so they worked very hard with us to create a content workflow that would ensure that the site stayed accessible. And it's still a challenge, right? And we still, we go, we can go to the site today and you know, it's maybe not 100% uh, on, on everything, but more than most organizations, uh, they were really committed to it. And so, Part of what we did is actually design a workflow and a technical architecture that would help them ensure that it was continuously compliant. And we're going to talk about uh, that, that as well. Yeah, and that's one of the advantages of having uh, reusable components, having a shared content repository that you push to different places, is that if you're worried about accessibility, you can manage a lot of that from the source. Right, so if those shared components, you put a lot of effort into making sure they're secure, making sure they're accessible, that they're built in the right way. If you're then reusing those components in different places, like WordPress and Drupal and a bunch of other things, if at least the source component was accessible and done correctly, you know you don't have to reproduce that effort everywhere it goes. Right, so that can be in the design component, it can also be in the original content. You can make sure that stuff is accessible from the source and it makes everywhere that it gets pushed a lot easier. Um, and if you have limited resources, like maybe some organizations have an accessibility expert. A lot of times if they do, they only have one person, right? And that one person's not gonna be going around doing accessibility scans to every single website and submitting reports about every single website over and over again. And getting your developers to fix the same problem on 20 different websites and like that kind of stuff takes forever. But if you have one source of truth for these things, it makes it easier to at least your security people and your accessibility people can focus on that one source of truth and usually it's a little better. Right? How many folks have worked with components today? All right, it's okay. So there are not too many folks that have really maybe first-hand knowledge of it. There are lots of different ways to implement com components. We'll, spend a little, we'll go a little bit deeper in, into it, but what we're basically talking about is uh, every time there's a banner on a page or a form on a page, or a block of related content on a page, something that might be a, a, a block in a, in a view, um, what the architectural team will do is create a re reusable um, uh, uh, element that can be brought in to uh, a, a, a new page, like a landing page or a child, page that can actually be placed while your 
uh, filling out the node entry form, right? So you go to content, create, you select your content entry form uh, in, in Drupal, and then the page that you select, in addition to being able to enter the title and the body and insert an image, allows you to actually insert a component of your choosing. And you choose from a drop down list what component you want to install, right, on that new page that you're creating. And that component that you install comes pre-configured with the styling of, of the, the brand, the organization that you're working with. Uh, it's also performant, it's secure, it's, it's been uh, d developed to be accessible. And what it allows you, site builders uh, and product owners to do is assemble all these different components into pages. Um, you know, on, on the go without code. So we'll get into it a tiny bit more, but I just didn't want to throw these words out component without giving some kind of explanation for folks that might not have seen them or worked with them before. Yeah. Like in this picture, like that hero image at the top would probably be a component that you would choose to add to the page. <clears throat> and making that reusable means you get the same result in all the places that you use that, and that unifies all your branding and all your design. Okay, so I think we just told you all that. They also really um, had bought into the idea of um, customer-driven um, na navigation or, or content. They, they were really made an effort to put their users at the center of the narrative. It wasn't all about saying, oh, look, or all the great things we do, uh, right? They really made an effort uh, at um, uh, limiting uh, the information that was, you know, thrown at clients when they first visited. And one of the reasons why they did this is they were trying to lay the groundwork for the per personalization down the road in Drupal 8. Right? So structured data and not and not throwing too much information at, at folks is an important part of that. Yeah, I think that's, like getting that menu sorted is always the hardest part of any project because the customers, you know, clients don't want to I don't want to hear it sometimes, right? Like menus are often built the way the institutional knowledge in the organization expected it to be built, and like even using wording that they expect, right? And that you have to get them to understand, like, okay, maybe the menu is following like the way your organization is set up in your departments and things like that. But is that something that a customer outside your organization understands? Like, don't build the menu for you; build the menu for them. Right, that takes a little doing to, to get that worked out, but when you do it, you, you usually see the benefit. Right? Put yourself in the perspective of the customer that's visiting the website, and how are they going to naturally expect to navigate to find different areas? Mm -hmm. So we also uh, operated from the point of view that this was going to need to be replicated. Um, in different in different ways for their new microsite structure. So this was built as a Drupal multi-site, um, uh, and uh, they're well positioned to to iterate uh, on it. Uh, so I think that this is really um, some of the things that we were talking about with with components, but they also because of some heavy integrations with some of the financial services and products like loan calculators uh, that were present on, on the site, they made really good use of Drupal 8's API structures. Uh, they had really good clean endpoints uh, in Drupal 8, something that was a struggle previously with their other uh, applications um, and uh, uh, something that they, they perceived a value of immediately when they started using using Drupal. It made it a lot easier for us to connect it to some of their uh, APIs as well. So imagine if you've got one site, like your Drupal site, and you've got a series of WordPress sites and a series of microsites that are standalone, and they all have the loan calculator on them. Like that's one particular component that you might want to make and be able to push to all the different areas. But really what is of concern is you need updated information based on like what those figures are. So like, what is the actual rate. Know, percentage rate right now? You need, if that changes, you need to be able to push that to all the different sites. So that's why you need one source of truth for that number. 
Um, it's, it became much easier to do something like keep some of that information either in a stored location that Drupal has access to or in Drupal itself and then Drupal can very easily, through its APIs, feed that to all the other locations that are using that calculator. Uh, and this goes for like even not just numbers. It might seem easy to like put a number someplace and push it or pull it somewhere, but like membership benefits. Like what is the whole list of the membership benefits that somebody gets for different uh, for different categories of membership and stuff like that? Like that might be listed in all kinds of different places. You don't want to have to like go to 15 different websites and find where that content is listed and change all of it. It'd be nice if it's in one location. Change it there, and then that gets pushed to all the different places regardless of what kind of website they are. All right? So using Drupal for that, it's really nice. to Use Drupal as a content hub, which is something we're doing a lot more of. Um, even if you don't need it for all your front ends and all your use cases, but use it as the place that can store all that content. And it's very good about releasing that content out to other sites, letting other sites pull that information out of Drupal uh, so you can just get all that updated information without having to go around and click buttons in 15 different sites to update everything. So, and, th and in, in line with that, what was really important to them, because they were relatively s small uh, financial inst inst institution, uh, is they wanted to try to flatten some of the workflow that was involved. So. Um, you know, take the point of the APIs and the components, right? So if you're on the business side and you're on the personal or consumer side and you have a loan calculator, well, those loan calculators are kind of sort of the same, right? But they're connecting to totally different products, totally different rates, totally different terms and the like. So they were really able to use, uh, together, we were really, able to present a solution that leveraged the most out of Drupal 8, uh, Drupal 8's mature AP APIs, and this component-based system. So now they, they could tap all those API connections, not have to recreate a component, but use a component that um, uh, served as a template in a lot of different parts of their site. Yeah, streamlining for marketing was really important for them because um, if you're a marketing person, you don't want to like spend your day being a professional Drupal content editor, right? Like going around and doing all these different things to manage all this content. What you actually want to do is marketing, right? And then when you want the small part of your job to be like, okay, then how do we get the stuff on the website? So getting everything unified and talking to each other makes everything easier because then you can edit in one place and then you don't have to worry about everything else. So the workflow becomes simplified. You can spend all your day actually doing marketing. And the same thing for the designers. The designers designed one thing. They don't have to say, I need to design this thing for Drupal and then design it for WordPress and then design it for something else. They don't have to even know what the CMSs are. They just design it one way for the one canonical source of where the components go, and then that just can just get implemented to all the different places that it needs to go. Right? Let's everybody focus most of their time on what their actual job is, not on managing the Drupal instances. Great. So, and then they actually, um, wanted um, a, a separate site, because it was indeed a separate staff, that um, could uh, help um, reinforce their messaging. Uh, and the, they, they took advantage of WordPress on there. And what the rails were effectively laid down to integrate those two different applications uh, when it was necessary. So, all right. So um, some screenshots, some examples, and then we'll get into a little, a little bit more, more depth with it. Um, but all the goals that uh, we were asked to uh, put together. Um, so with a, a project of this complex and a staff, an IT staff and a marketing uh, staff that uh, you know wasn't such a deep bench, we, we tend in most of our projects, but in particular in a project like this, to really front load uh, the project with planning and consulting, right? So we find that the more we do of this, uh, the easier all the development goes uh, and the less we have to go back and redevelop. And so we use, you know, a, a process, right? Uh, and, and this is a kind of a standard uh, process uh, that we modify for, for every different client. And this is a glimpse of the type of process points and material that we share with the client to make them, help them understand 
you know, what our expectations are and what they can expect of us. And so these tools in the development process and the engagement process is part of that making the, uh, the experience so great on both sides of the screen, right? Yeah, I'd say the on-site workshop is, for me, the most important part of the process. Um, I know we're all like, we're a distributed company and a lot of people are distributed. Everybody thinks, well, we can do everything online. We just send messages and we write emails and we write documents and stuff like that. Uh, but so many of like, the really big projects we work on are, I would say every single one of them is like, completely miscommunicated, right? Because people don't know how to speak the same language and like, what you think is in your head is not what you wrote in the Word document and not the way the other person read it. But then when you go to the on-site workshop and we sit down for three days in face the conference to face. room, yeah. The whiteboard, I'm like, oh, that's not what you said in that document, or like, oh, that's a, compl and then we sit down and we work it all out, and like, okay, now we have a plan, now I understand what you are trying to actually implement. I think people really need to do that stuff. I've worked on lots of projects that people just think like, oh, we'll just get started now. Like, let's just get right to the development, and we'll talk about it, we'll open tickets, we'll come up with some plans, we'll do stuff, it's like, even for something small, if it's if it's just one day where you're just on a go to meeting or something, and everybody's sitting there actually talking to each other and trying to figure it all out, you have to do that. And even and for a really long project, do that in phases too. Don't just do it once in the beginning and spend like a year working on a really big project. Like time to reflect. Do it every like three months. Yeah. That's usually what we do in a big one. Is we do it every quarter of workshop because like we get to a certain point and like. Now I need to talk about those new features again. I need to talk about what we learned from the last quarter of what we're doing. Are we making adjustments to how that plan was actually set up? Right? Don't do the workshop just once and then yeah. never talk to each other ever again and just make it. That's a really critical point, yes. During these workshops, are you demoing pieces of the product that you built out or are you just talking? We can. We do that routinely uh, during as part of our sprinting process, right, where we're working on something and then we're showing folks what we built. So these workshops are different from your sprint? Yeah, yeah, so I'm really glad you zeroed in on, on, on that. So um, when I say front loading, what 99% what of our projects have is a really well-defined discovery process. And uh, most of those have on-site components. And what we, we do during those on-sites is we meet, we greet, hi, how are you? But we actually have working sessions. You know, bring your laptop, bring the stuff, show me, let's sit right shoulder to shoulder, point it out to me. Let's make sure that you know that I understood what you were telling me. It's that, it's that kind of thing. And so we might demonstrate something during, during that. And then what David is saying is, yeah, we have short, um, concise projects like Eastern Bank, but then we also have like projects like the Olympics, which we're working on for a year and a half in advance, right? And so after the initial discovery, right, we'll come back and reconvene on a regular basis to do this type of mini discovery workshop as a subset of something that we're working on, all while we or are, are working on sprints and de and and developing, so sort of like in parallel mm -hmm. tracks. Do you want to add yeah, to the that? last one I just did about a month ago. We were basically we had a front end developer in the room, back end developer, two of the UX guys who were doing design and content strategy, um, and as well as the people from the client side. And that was, I think, three days, pretty much eight hours a day, and just in the conference room with the whiteboard, with paper, quickly drawing up wireframes, writing everything out, making lists, like, okay, what is your categorization? Like, to make sure I understand what your products are, how you're grouping them, what your stakeholders are expecting, and then even during those, during those days, you do things like, okay, you have an SEO expert, set up a conference call with them while we're here at one o'clock, and we'll talk to them on the phone for half an hour, and we like hash out some of this stuff. What are your expectations? What are you trying to solve? And we like taking notes, writing all this sort of stuff down. At the end of the day, you send the notes to everybody and agree on it. Like, is this everything we heard today? 
If you miss something, add it to the notes, and you go to the next day, you do the same thing. If there's another stakeholder you have to talk to, set up a meeting, we'll talk to them on the phone while we're here, or bring them in, whatever, and like you do the whole thing, and like make sure we understand everything. Because those workshops are about understanding. It's not about like doing anything. Because out of that, you then take what you now understand and start working on a plan. Yeah, that's really critical. And especially because once you write everything down and make sure you understand it and you send it to the client, and then six weeks later, you can go, that's not what we talked about. Collectively, how many people were involved in this project? Um, the this Eastern part, Standard, I'm not too sure. Um, that was a little, yeah. there was a lot of different people in and there out. There were about a dozen folks involved in yeah. this. I've had, we've had some projects where it's not as many people as you'd expect, because it really just depends on how the project is scheduled. For something that's fast, it's always more people, because you've got to get it done fast. But yeah. like, we can do a really big project with like five people. Right? It really depends on what you're doing, and like how you properly schedule everything out. And we we'll, just manage the expectations. I don't, I don't, I think I actually have anything but we also we're a little bit more segmented than a, a lot of organizations or Drupal vendors for a couple of different reasons but like one of the things that we've always really believed in is project management so we've had project managers that were dedicated to a, to a, a, a project that we gave the time to understand the project and we've had a QA team right not your senior technical lead QAing different pieces of the development or the sprints, but then actually a, a QA lead that with QA analysts and QA engineers will do visual inspections, making sure that we actually did what we said we were going to do on the scope and that ticket was filled out, right? And QA analysts are doing that. Then we got a set of QA engineers. So, um, and, and do we have that? For every project, yeah, we just don't have like half a dozen QA per people on every every project. We don't have you know 600 hours of, of QA on every project. Sometimes we just have six hours of QA on a, on a project. Yeah, it might be like one person just an hour a day. Yeah, and they're doing lots of different projects at the same time because they only need the QA when you give them something to the QA. They're not like sitting around waiting. Yeah, right? but the important part is like not skipping those steps, especially for like small projects, right? Because the devil's in the details. It's like, oh yeah, it's a small project. Yeah, I'm like, oh, forgot about that. Oh, forgot about that. Next thing you know, you're not just developing once; you're developing three or four different times. And then you're, you know, over on you have overage. You know, you're out of time. Out of, oh, you know, can't fulfill your scope. You're over budget. So this was um, sort of you look at the, the work that we had to do for Eastern, and you say, okay, it's not that complicated. It's mostly a forward facing. Uh, site, yes, there's some pretty significant integrations and some features and things like that, but like, okay, it's not too bad. But then you're like, right, they're a bank, okay? And personally identifiable information and all that, okay? And even though there were silos for this data, right, we had to make sure that we were going through a process of due diligence. And so the, our discovery involved surveys and things like that with security uh, questions and the like. And we just sort of, sort of wanted to show you an example of the types of different processes that you need to go through on, on different projects. If it's a healthcare organization uh, or a trade union or something like that, might be a little bit different. But these types of or, or organizations, especially when there's any amount of regulation uh, involved, uh, you really have to sort of factor these things into your your time, your budget, no matter what end of the, the project you sit on, whether or not you're a product owner, a vendor, an individual developer, or a project manager, these types of things take time and effort and uh, ensure the, um, the security of, of your end work. Our UX team does a lot of surveys, too. Um, it's not just a security thing. Yeah. Because it's, yep. like, you know, there's always... There's always stakeholders who are not in the room, right? And so you might be dealing with a marketing person or IT person or whatever, but there's always like this team of like eight other people that use the site or have inputs and, and so forth and they're not always there. Um, so the UX team is, is big on making surveys that are sent to those people to get their input, because uh, that's really important, not just the input of the one person that's in the room. Um, and I think that serves a number of purposes. One, it gets a lot of information 
from that larger group that maybe previously was getting filtered by the one person you were actually interacting with that you may not realize, like maybe they don't give a certain sense of urgency or, or represent a certain problem that the larger group does. Because um, maybe like the editorial people are not in the room because they're not the decision maker. But the decision maker is not the one who's doing all the editing. And they don't realize that there's a certain part of the editing process that's a problem. And you don't hear that unless you actually talk to that person. All right, so the surveys are helpful for that. But also, I find that's really helpful from our perspective in helping the client because those surveys often um, make it understood to the other stakeholders that we're listening and we're trying to get information from them. And, and sometimes, depending on the organization, they don't always feel that even within their own group. Right? But we're reaching out to them directly, making sure we get that information from them. And then that gets a little more enthusiasm from them. It gets them to open up a little bit more, and then you'd be surprised what kind of information you actually start getting from people, and what problems actually exist that you don't necessarily realize that you can solve, and then that makes everybody happy, and that's, that's part of like the both sides of the screen kind of thing that we try to do. Yeah, and like this is an excerpt of our project plan just for the design and prototyping part of it. You, know, you can see that it's in fair amount, fair amount of detail, and of course, um, Obviously, there's certain aspects of the project that we can share and can't, but you know, each of these columns was part of a larger worksheet that had resources and, and time periods as in how, how complete it, it was and the like. So, but you Did can they have any design in mind or a UI uh, recommended? Pardon me? Which one design? Uh, have a design in mind. Have anything in mind how they want the site to be looked at? They, they had um, some previous branding that they wanted to um, have the new design reflect, right? So they've you know, been in business for 200 years. They didn't want something completely different. They wanted a refresh. So, um, you know, it's not from the ground, ground up. You don't do the type of ideation that you would do in you know a, a madman type scenario or even a modern uh, s scenario we really had uh, to refresh and and support the you know the brand by by making sure folks could recognize it right but see that they were keeping up with the times right that was really like the, the challenge what about you? you guys did focus groups or uh, the client was taken care of? A little bit of both. They came with, with data, they came with information, and then we followed up and clarified. Yeah, and most of the time I would say when our, our teams do like a focus group or something, um, often it's us that does it for them because we have um, experts that can handle that. Yeah, and sometimes like even when they have a you know great designer that they work with for a long time or firm, it has to be done over again because they're like, okay, you're speaking German and we need to speak French or something like that. And don't um, you know. don't dismiss the idea of like sometimes when we do those focus groups, it's not just for their organization. Like we will work with them to reach out to like their own customers. Yes. And develop focus groups. That's for a their good customers point. Because those are actually the people that you need to talk to. Mm -hmm. Right, like I, I don't care if Bob in accounting thinks that like the menu's great. Like I need to like talk to like who your key customers are and see if they can find stuff on the website or if they're having problems. The sites for that. Right? Yeah, the point that David makes is really really important. I know we're getting a little bit away from it, but um, I don't think we actually did this for for East, Eastern Bank, but we did a project, a discovery project recently for the New York State um, Attorney General's office, right and. Uh, they are a perfect example of a site that was organized around their bureaus and departments and what they do as opposed to what people needed and what they might be visiting them for. And one of the first things that we did, the engagement was over the course of a couple of months, one of the first things we did was put a little hot jar questionnaire that would pop up and say, what are you trying to do? Were you successful? Did you find it? And you know, we got, we got such a wealth of information. And all these stakeholders that, you know, knew what they wanted, they were like, oh, okay, I, I guess uh, let me rethink that a little bit. So, so one of the ways that, that, you know, like I say, even if you hire an awesome design t team, um, we have found that um, when it gets down to preparing for the uh, development, we have 
uh, embraced you know, the, a component, this component-based design for a number of different reasons. And one of them is that um, it can really align very nicely with the work of designers and, and, and uh, branding or organizations um, because we can take some of those visual elements and build out um, you know, things that used to be called style tiles, right? Now, but now we express them in terms of this atomic design process where we're starting to identify, well, what, what, what are the atoms, what molecules come from those atoms can we put together? How can we assemble those uh, you know, molecules into larger organisms and full pages? So if, if folks are not familiar with atomic design, I urge you to get familiar with it. It's a really handy tool. Sometimes you, you don't always have like this full-blown implementation. Sometimes you have full-blown implementations and don't use them, uh, in which case it's a waste. Um, but to understand the concept of it and to under, understand how to use it as a tool uh, is really in, 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 in important moving forward. And we made use of this for, for this project. We've made use of it for other projects. And it really supports the component-based design activity. Uh, yeah, so if you're not familiar with it, Pattern Lab is just it's a technology solution for enabling this whole atomic design system. So. It's atomic design is just the methodology for a designer, like how I'm going to design things. Pattern Lab is the actual technology of the, how we're going to write the code to do it. Um, I'm not big on using these systems on just like one site, and this is significantly large and has a lot of components you have to keep reusing and in different ways and have derivatives of them. Um, so if you have a very simple site, it doesn't always make sense. But for a use case like this, where Again, like a designer is saying, I want to make a component and I want to design it once. I don't want to design it five times. I want to do it one time and like be able to push it to all these different sites, even though we've got five Drupal sites, three WordPress sites, like how do we do that? Right? Something like Pattern Lab really enables that because you basically design it once in the Pattern Lab and then the Pattern Lab you can push to all the different areas that you need. Yeah, and forgive me because I'm going to say this for the very end, if, if hopefully we're still going to have time. Um, uh, but since we switched laptops, I, I've had it all set up to switch Windows, but we'll do it at the end rather than in interrupt and run the risk. But um, we can actually show you a little bit of how this, this works. We'll do it in particular. Um, we, we did the, the Stanford uh, project, but a project I like to highlight because we're in the tri-state area is done by a colleague who's actually here at the um, uh, camp, Richard. Um, uh, and. Uh, uh, he works with uh, Stony Brook, and they've put this Unity framework uh, together that's uh, built around the concept of atomic design and, and components. Um, and uh, uh, you can read this through, share links and the like. But I wanted to like get to some of the, the where the rubber hit the road on the Eastern pro project. One of the things that that we were asked to do is help them understand how they could leverage this website build. Okay. And, and have, have it help them do all the other things that they needed to do in this world of online and retail, personal and business banking. Right? So we were able to show them, say, okay, you want to, you need kiosks. They have kiosks all over the place in, in their banking institutions. And they came to us and said, you know, these kiosks, it's like a whole separate deal. You know, we got to get the hardware and we got to get, you know, there's developers who are working on this. And we're like, stop, you know, that was the old way of doing things. Now you, you, you're investing in this process. You're structuring your data. You're using an awesome platform like, like Drupal. You're going to take advantage of this for something like a kiosk. Right, so I don't know how well you can see it, but that's supposed to be a desk, okay? And that's a, that's an iPad, you know, in a special little holder, right? And and this is effectively a microsite, right? Built off of their um, platform that uh, was created for them. That really is just limited to the things that you'd engage, you know, on a kiosk or, around. Uh, and so th this electronic signage and all things um, or have been supported now uh, by the use of this robust platform and the architecture that we were able to to bring uh, to the to the project 
uh, through APIs, through components, um, through atomic design. Yeah. So we were talking before about things like membership benefits and loan calculator and the like. If you have a kiosk in the lobby of the bank, right, somebody goes in and it's a touch screen, you click on it and there's a button that says like membership benefits and it's got like a little bullet list of stuff. Well, where did that content come from? Right? Does marketing now have to like build, have some whole other system where they're going in and uploading that stuff just to go to the kiosk? No, we made it come from the Drupal site. And that can have like a screen with up-to-date loan um, percentages, you know, oh, we got 3.5% APR this month or whatever, and it like automatically just shows up on the screen, but it can just pull it from one place. You know, and, and there are so many different use cases, like, you know, you walk in your lobby, you want to talk to someone, you don't have an appointment, okay, but there's that kiosk right in front of you, and now what is it? It's a form, right? It's a form in Drupal that they can fill out. Okay, Drupal could check to see who's in that day, who's available, okay, and if somebody can know whether or not there's time to go to, uh, to, to bring their, their kid to the corner of the bank now that's got the little uh, children's furniture set up and, and Lego blocks for them to play, whether or not they've got time to go get a cup of coffee at the other corner, right, because this is modern commercial retail banking. So it's all, they really saw this as a linchpin in their customer service, um, customer experience um, uh, plan. And isn't it nice that the styling on your kiosk is exactly the same as the styling that's on your homepage website? Right. Right, how do you do that? Instead of reinventing the wheel, well, you can have the kiosk feed from the same pattern lab that you're using for everything else. So, um, briefly, uh, we're, we, we're nowhere at, at, at time. Um, um, we were able to, to do this project within their, their timeline, provide for them the enhanced security and features that they requested, um, uh, and um, make sure that we could test uh, every site that part of uh, that was built on their platform, um, and, and rigorously assess any kind of security uh, concerns before uh, they went uh, live. And we did so in a manner that was uh, fully accessible uh, and they could ensure the accessibility uh, through virtue of this component-based design uh, system moving forward when they created new landing pages uh, and, the, and the like. So uh, we um, uh, are very pleased and proud of the work that, that we did and I, we hope that it's been helpful sharing uh, some of it. We really apologize for the technical difficulties and the, and, the, and the like, and I'm certainly willing to speak in more detail uh, afterwards, just our tables right around the bend, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.